Welcome to our usual pre-match ramblings before the game against Nottingham Forest. And it'd be fair to say a club that has been a fair history between Sheffield United uh, and Forest down the years. People always ask you, when you work in football, the best game you've ever worked. And bear in mind, we work every home game. Um, I suppose away games as well, to a degree. But every home game, and that's over a long, long period of time. In fact, one day we'll have to sit down and work out how many games I've worked for this football club behind the scenes. But when they ask you, there's a couple of close contenders, I suppose, but <clears throat> in terms of sheer emotion, uh, the adrenaline of the night, the outcome, uh, got to be the semi-final second leg here uh, against Forest back in 2003. Uh, what an incredible night that was. Um, first game down at City Ground, won one Michael Brown penalty, of course. Um, so they set the game up for here. We've been brilliant all season. Uh, we looked down and out, 50 plus minutes on the clock. And then the fight back came and I've still never worked through a match with an atmosphere like that. <clears throat> and we've worked to some of the biggest games at the club stage in the last 30 years. Uh, but behind the scenes in the terraces and after the game was something really, really special to be a part of. And it's one of my fondest memories of my time on the staff at Sheffield United. Um, Again, with Forrest and the Blades down the years, probably one of our first encounters, not so much with Forrest, but with this, the, uh, the city ground, was in the epic FA Cup semi-final run of 1898-99, when the Blades went to the final that year and beat Derby by four goals to one at Crystal Palace. There were four semi-final replays, and one of those was at the city ground, which Forrest wouldn't have been in there long at that point. And it's brilliant when you read the transport for a top-flight football club uh, from Nottingham Railway Station up to the football ground. They were collected on a drayman's cart, uh, a beer cart, and the whole team, Folks, Needham, Thicket, Boyle, all these great players, all got taken up to the ground over the bridge, uh, pulled by a horse-drawn beer cart, arriving glamour and style. Um, I think it's also possibly, we're looking at stats, I don't think there's many teams that's fielded in top class games and semi-finals and stuff like that. A defence with a combined weight of over 50 stones, uh, says me sat here on a stool like this, perched precariously. Um, but Thicket, Folks and Peter Boyle, alone between the three of them, top the scales at over 50 stone. That's one big heavy defence, isn't it? Um, players down the years, of course, loads of players play for both football clubs. One of my favourite early stories, a guy called Enoch West or Knocker West, as he was better known. Uh, we signed him from a sort of Nottinghamshire local league side for a fee of about five pounds. And he came into a great Sheffield United team, never played in the first team. I think he scored six goals in probably not many more reserve team appearances. But United Board of Directors decided he hadn't got the attitude or the aptitude to make it at top flight football. And they let him go. Uh, and he went back for a little spell in non-league football before Nottingham Forest signed him. Uh, and he went on to become a sort of early 1900s Forest legend, banged in loads of goals for Forest. Uh, so much so that he became a target for the then up and growing Manchester United. He was signed for Man U. And in early football, in terms for the Reds, again, he's an absolute legend of a player, scored loads of important goals. Um, also, one of the first players ever to be banned from football for an alleged betting scandal. 1914-15 uh, season, season of course at Sheffield United, went to Old Trafford and played Chelsea in the FA Cup final, beat them 3-0. Uh, there was a, a chance of Manchester United getting relegated, I think that's how it runs. But late on in the season, not long before we played there in April, um, Manchester United played Liverpool and the, the result was, was quite dubious and then quite soon after the game, uh, people were handing out sort of business cards in the streets of Manchester, alleging that people had thrown this game on purpose. Uh, and there were was, was several players banned for it. Um, West was one of them. Uh, another very famous Manchester United player called Sandy Turnbull, I think, was barred in that. But they were all barred from football for life. And very soon after the end of the First World War, I don't think many of them actually played top flight football again. One of them was killed in action. Uh, during World War I. Um, the others were pardoned uh, for their part in the allegation of this match fixing. 
Um, West refused to accept the policy. He actually refused to ever admit that he'd been involved in it in any shape or form. And he felt he'd been totally unfairly dealt with. The others, I think, admitted it, got a wrap on the wrists and were allowed to play a game again or be eligible to play football. West never did. Uh, and he was the only one of the players involved in the match-fixing trial uh, that on his death in the late 1940s, he actually died. Um, still a guilty man in a lot of senses. He refused to admit any part whatsoever in the scandal. And it shook football to its absolute foundations just prior to the First World War. I think before we wrap up on this one, a player that... Uh, it's really quite poignant that both clubs or both his major former clubs meet each other in the week he passed away. Uh, and that was the oldest surviving Sheffield United and Forest and I believe Coventry player um, in the shape of Colin Collinridge. Now, I was lucky enough to know Colin reasonably well uh, down the years of work here and certainly dealing with ex-players. And if I said that Colin Collinridge was a character, that would be a real understatement. One of the funniest people I have ever met in football. And if they said that a player could tell a tale... I kid you not, that if you rang Colin for anything, and Colin lived just outside of Newark, if I had to ring Colin Coleridge, you would always set aside a minimum of a couple of hours because there was absolutely no chance of you ever escaping Colin once he started telling a tale. He was absolutely brilliant. And to give you a bit of sort of background to that story and why it's so interesting, <clears throat> Colin was born in Bar Green near uh, Barnsley. And we signed him initially on amateur forms, get this, 1938. Just think about that. Second World War hasn't even broken out. He's signed for Sheffield United probably 18 months after we've just played in what is so far our last FA Cup final against Arsenal. Now, this seems like ancient history when you think about it now. But a man passed away this week who signed for the club within 18 months of that final. Um, Went into a great Sheffield United team. There's players like Jimmy Hagan, uh, Harry Hooper, Jack Smith, Ernest Jackson. Some great, great names. In fairness, he didn't get his first team bow until after the war had broken out. Uh, about 1940, I think he actually made the first team. And by that point, within weeks of the war being declared, of course, the Football League, as we know, it was abandoned. And then it was split up into wartime north, wartime south, etc. Um during the war, of course, he guested for other teams like Chesterfield. And it would be fair to say he lost five or six years of a very, very good fledgling career to, to the conflict. But as soon as the war was over, in fact, during the war, played a huge part in the wartime cup semi-final for the Blades against Villa at Villa Park, which we lost overall. Also played a huge part in the winning of the wartime Division North Championship title. In 1945, that trophy's still up in the boardroom. And one thing that always fascinated, and he could tell you all these amazing stories about the games he played, his memory to the virtually the end was razor sharp. It was a joy to listen to. <clears throat> but he played a part in the only, or the first, uh, English team to play on German soil after the surrender in 1946. Sheffield United sent out their first team to play a combined forces 11, players like Leslie Compton, at the Olympic Stadium in Berlin. Um, and I've been lucky to know a fair few of the players that played in that. And Colin told me when they flew them out, they flew them out from RAF Finningley. He said, and we went on this old-fashioned airplane with Dakota or wherever it was. He said, and as the, the plane took off, through the gaps in the floorboards on the plane, you could see the ground disappearing. And he said it was like half-inch gaps on all the floorboards. I don't like flying anyway, so that would have finished me completely. Uh, Colin Ridge also played in the only Sheffield derby, or one of only two Sheffield derbies, not to be played in Sheffield. And certainly the only one not actually played on mainland Britain. Uh, 1948, Sheffield United played Sheffield Wednesday on the Isle of Man. And it's quite famous. Recently, I've got some footage on it from Sunday in the Isle of Man, which we're trying to get renovated to see if we can do anything with it. Not hours and hours of footage, just enough showing Hagen College and players like that. Um, and I never really understood what it was all about, but apparently the Isle of Man Brewery, one of the local breweries, let's say it's open anchor, not 100% sure, but at the time we got a director. There were two brothers. One of the brothers was a Blade, and he was one of our directors. 
and one of the other the other brother was a Wednesday fan. He was on their board of directors or associated with it. And as a publicity stunt, if you like, they arranged a game on the Isle of Man. So Sheffield Wednesday flew out there. United being United, we took the ferry, and I think had to hitchhike down. Um, but the more, one of the most famous United Wednesday games that never to take place in the city. Um, and Connery's played in that game. He could tell you all these totally amazing stories. When he, he finally left us, 48, uh, he went to Nottingham Forest. Forest. And he played a huge part in their third division championship winning side. Uh, so Colin had got a third division championship medal with Forest. And then from Forest went to Coventry City. And I think, as I said earlier, he was the oldest surviving player of all three clubs uh, before drifting to non-league football. And then he was in the catering industry, but he was a, a varmint for singing. And you think of people and you smile. I always remember one of the last games he came to. And if Colin got an audience, he was brilliant. And he was upstairs in the director's box. And every time we came through, he was singing Sinatra songs at the top of his voice uh, and serenading the ladies. He was a card. Um, but he sadly passed away on Sunday, not being well for a while. Um, and a huge part of football history for us dies with Colin. Um, good friend and colleague of mine, Gary Armstrong, who wrote Blade Runner, did an interview with him about 15 or 16 years ago, which he's never used. And Gary's been kind enough to form me that across. So maybe we'll try and use that uh, for something, because it's certainly worth reading. But uh, a couple of Colin's sons are at the match tomorrow. They've come to watch. And what we're going to ask people to do from both sets of clubs is in the 11th minute, which the number 11 is the shirt he wore pretty well, apart from a few spells in the nine, the most for us. Give a round of applause in this, this great old boy's memory. You know, there are very, very few people around that will have seen him play getting less and less by the year, of course. But, you know, to live to 98 is a hell of an achievement anyway. But to see all that football, you know, imagine a player that signed for us before war had broken out. You know, how different would Sheffield have been then? How different would the Blades have been then? The crowds that we got. To play through the war, you know, and after that. What an incredible life. So, uh, we've got there in a roundabout kind of way, but on behalf of everybody at the football club, We'd like to send our very best to Colin's family. Uh, we thought a lot about Colin. As I said earlier, the word character was certainly uh, plucked out of the diction when they, uh, they thought of Colin Coleridge. Uh, and I hope that each and every one of you encourages the person next to you in the 11th minute to stand up and give a big, big round of applause for the passing of really the last of the kind. Uh, so that's a bit about Forest, a bit about players that's played for both clubs, games that's taken place and a bit of a fond memory and a rest in peace to Colin Coleridge. Enjoy the game.